So I'm going to talk about the Chinese Communist Party. So uh, we just ended the 20th Party Congress in which the Communist Party cemented common prosperity as a core part of the economic agenda of the nation. Of course, many newspapers, many media organizations kind of interpreted that as President Xi Jinping sending a warning signal to the wealthy as he opens new front in common prosperity push. And it's kind of well known that you know, when you talk to investors, people in the stock market, in banks, in rooms such as this, full of business students, people generally get spooked out by talk about inequality, common prosperity. So here, Alex Lo says, you know, Xi Jinping's China is no longer about letting the rich get richer, but that's not what big time investors want to hear. And here is sort of the same theme. Analysts urge greater development of the private economy that accommodates a vast majority of China's jobs, growth, drivers, and revenue. So what do you hear all the time? The narrative around this is, you know, China is kind of becoming more close. So let me, you know, let me sort of think about moving out. But here's a thought for you. Moving out won't save you because inequality is pervasive. What is this? Think of this as a cake. Each vertical slice of the cake represents a country. The, more, the farther away from me that you go in the axes, those are the richest people and the amount of wealth they have. So you see, starting from the poorest to the richest countries, inequality is pretty pervasive. In almost every country, if you think about eating this cake and you're closer to me, you're a poorer person, you get a very, very thin part of the slice. This issue is not specific to China. I go back to the US and I go back to a time when we had a president whom some of you might like a bit better than, than what we have uh, in US politics now. And this is President Obama basically echoing the same thing. Income inequality is the defining challenge of our times. So is this troubled times for students of business, students who would graduate in a few years hopefully go on the job market. Are you going to get worse jobs? Are you even going to get jobs? We can all be a little bit negative about what we see around us. And th this kind of, you know, a bit of digression reminds me of a friend's mother who became very negative towards the end of her life. So I kind of went to meet her, and I sat down and I said, you know, whatever date it was, I said, you know, hey, today is the 1st of October. And she looked at me and said, yes, isn't that dreadful? So we can all be very, very negative, but we could also try and figure out if there are opportunities to do something else for you and for us. For you, as business students that go out, should you rethink the way you are going to do business? And should we, as educators, rethink the way we should teach in the classroom? For example, is a firm's objective just going to be to maximize profits? Or can it be something else along with the proximization of profits? So Kailung asked me to do this in the structure of a TED talk. And so here's, and TED talks are meant to be one idea. So here's my one idea for the day. Can markets partner with the states to improve the condition of people in civil society? The idea is businesses need to do this. Businesses need to partner the state in helping people. Quoting Benjamin Franklin, we all need to do well by doing good. Now you might be thinking, how do you do that? There's two steps to it. Step one, I need to be able to convince you that it will work for the government. If the government allows the private sector to participate in this process of development, then the private sector can indeed be a good partner. Let me underline that and take a pause for a minute to let that sink in, and then tell you the two steps to this. It needs to be the case that the private sector can recognize who needs help, and it needs to be forthcoming in providing the help to the people that needs it the most. Second, 
The government has to be convinced that by letting the private sector do this, we are not going to make the problem of inequality any worse. So I could get you to lend in villages, but you could be going into the village and lending to the richest villagers, making intra-village inequality even worse than it is now, because that's what's good for you. And on the other hand, I need to convince businesses that it is still possible to make profits, even in a world of common prosperity. How would you do that? You need to break away from the pack of what we have been doing before, because the world has changed, and with that, we need to change. In this paper, we're going to hopefully try and convince you that this is all possible. And to do that, we are going to delve into the world of finance, in particular, the world of finance for poor people in rural villages. The first part, can the private sector recognize who needs help in the distribution of the country's population and provide it? Because you know, I'm a finance professor and I have to do finance here. I'm going to focus on a finance angle here and think about a bank. So when productive opportunities improve, let's say through some kind of state policy, Finance 101 is going to say that more financing should go to the people who see the highest improvements in productivity. Because that's going to allow them to take advantage of the changes that have been happening in the real world and do a bit better for themselves. But does private profit-motivated financing really respond to productivity changes, even for the world's poor? Why the poor? Because for the poor, dollar amounts are low. You may be giving a $100 loan. But that $100 may make a difference between life and death for some people. It can make a difference between who can start a business and who cannot, who can get education and who cannot who can attempt to realize their dreams, and who cannot. So I'm going to look at, in particular, productivity improvements through the construction of roads. In many parts of the world, we know infrastructure projects are particularly topical these days. And here's a map of the mainland and roads all over the country. 1992, 2000, and 2010, you see this rapid expansion in roads. I could show you the same map of India, and you would realize that India, over the last 20 years, has built 2 million kilometers of roadways. Many people who had never seen a road in their life, a proper asphalt road, because they lived in interior villages, now have access to one. But how is this going to make people's lives better? Well, first, they could do so by changing crop patterns for farmers from cereal farming, which is typically subsistence, production of rice and wheat, to profitable market-based crops that can be sold for higher prices. And I'm thinking here, think here of tomatoes. Now, why does rice versus tomatoes uh, make a difference uh, with roads? It's very simple. If you cultivate rice or wheat, you can store the product if it's the middle of the monsoon season when you harvest, you can wait four months before your you know, washed out mud pathway to the village comes back in the dry season and then take it to the local market and sell it. But you cannot do this with tomatoes. Tomatoes need to be sold immediately. You need a road, you need transportation to get to the market immediately. It could enable, roads could enable surplus agricultural laborers to commute to nearby towns for work when needed. And roads could allow small village level entrepreneurship. Think about opening a small store that sells bread. The bread, the market for that bread is probably not going to be all in that village. You could produce a lot more if you had a, you know, a cycle rickshaw or a, or, a, you know, or a tuk tuk going to the nearest town through a road. You could sell your bread a little bit better. I have three tables. I'm going to get one in quickly before your patience varies away. And this is the table that shows you that finance is actually key to seeing people benefit from roads. 
So what do we do here? We run a simple regression where we differentiate, you know, two villages, both get roads. The top panel looks at areas where there's a good, vibrant financial market, and a village with a vibrant financial market gets a road. Whereas the bottom panel looks at areas where there's not, not much financing going on, so the financial market is not deep, and that village gets a road. On the left-hand side, the dependent variable that we are studying here is changes in growth. So what do you see? Roads produce growth as expected, but mostly in areas which have pre-existing good, deep financial markets. Now, it's typically assumed by many policymakers that once you build the roads, financing will automatically follow. But we know from a different literature that many rural economies actually suffer from chronic problems of financing. So the proportion worldwide of the marginal rural farmer who does not have access to any credit is 87. So 87 out of every 100 poor farmers have no access to credit. So how do you expect the world of financing to automatically solve this problem? Well, you could talk to me about informal money lenders that exist in these villages, who formal statistics like these don't capture. But it's a well-known fact that informal money lenders charge really high interest rates. So you know, you're the landlord, you lend $500 to your laborer that tills your land. He probably won't be able to pay back your 50% interest rate but that ties him down to your land for the next 30 years, and you've basically acquired a bonded laborer. We also know that state-subsidized financial institutions dominate rural lending, but these institutions have had historic difficulties, both in terms of outlook and profitability. Often, there's a lack of political will in addressing these questions, so these financial institutions are mainly used as political instruments to, let's say, wave off all farmer loans before an election and win that election. So this makes rural lending loss-making. And even, so this is an example from India, the largest Indian state lender, the State Bank of India, in 2015 appointed the consulting firm McKinsey to teach them how to do rural lending. Private banks, however, encouragingly, are increasingly interested in this area. So the ANZ, the ANZ, this is an Australian bank, started the Chongqing ANZ Rural Bank. HSBC, Standchart City have also opened rural branches in the mainland. New private banks in India, HDFC, Axis, etc., are also upbeat about expansion because they realize urban markets are getting saturated rather than chasing the same urban customer competing with 10 different other banks who look exactly like you. Maybe there's more room to get into some of these rural areas, allow these villagers to enjoy opportunities that the state is providing for them through the buildup of infrastructure and make money thereby. There is actually precedence of the private sector helping out in different contexts. For example, in India back in 1990s, the entire conversation was about how a lot of these villages lack a simple telephone connection, and giving it would help. And this was a massive exercise. It was thought that it would take India 50, 60 years to do that, to set up landline phones in villages. So how did the country solve it? Well, they didn't solve it. What happened was there are still no landlines in Indian villages, but there's mobile telephone towers that cover every single corner of the country. And these mobile telephone towers were mostly set up by private sector players, and this is who facilitated the information revolution in rural India. So now if I've managed to convince you that this is a question you should spend five minutes thinking about, what's the difficulty in answering this question? Can this be done? It's difficult to answer whether private sector banks would indeed go and lend out in areas with lots of infrastructure, because we can observe what happens before and after in a particular area. After an area gets road, I see a bank give out lots of loans in that area. But we would not know whether this increase in lending in areas with roads was actually caused by the private sector realizing that roads present an opportunity, therefore I should be lending in that village, or, or was it all driven 
by, let's say, a powerful politician who kind of pressurized the government to get the loan to their area and who independently pressurized the bank to start lending more in that area. How do we distinguish between that? Well, it could be solved very easily if we could find two identical villages, one of them, one of them randomly gets picked and gets a road. The other one randomly does not get picked and does not get a road. And then we could compare the village with the road, with the village without the road, without worrying about the politician's influence, because the village that got the road got it randomly, not because some politician wanted the road to go there. However, this is going to be very, very difficult in the real world. We can't randomize roads. So what are we going to do? Well, in this paper, we're going to look at a road building program in India which prioritized lending to villages just above certain population thresholds. So the country was getting you know, somewhat richer. They had money to spend. They wanted to do that by building roads out into unconnected villages. But you had to have a rule which village gets it first, because otherwise it'll be a free for all and all politicians would jump and compete for the money. So what they decided was, well, you know, it kind of makes sense to provide roads for larger villages. But once you're the government, you're going to have to make a rule. You're going to put down a number. And they, so they put down fixed number. They said, OK, first, all villages with populations above 1,000 are going to get the road. Second, 500, and so on. So what do we do? We assume that a village with a population, let's say, 480, is basically extremely similar to a village with a population of 520. But because 500 is a cutoff in this road building policy, the village with 480 is not going to get a road, whereas the one with 520 is. So we exploit this discontinuity at a population of 500 to generate what kind of gets close to the ideal of random variation in roads. Just to be clear, we're not saying a village with a population of 5,000 is going to be similar to a population of 400. We're going to look closely around the cutoff Let's say I look only at villages between populations 400 and 600. Slightly less than 500 between 400 and 499 are very similar, indeed, to villages that are slightly above 500, 501 to 600. So then we look at, we went to one of India's largest private banks, and we got from them data on two states where they were trying to experiment with rural lending. So they set up a few branches in some rural areas, and they were doing lending at that point. So we asked them, can we see your data? And so you know, we got a bunch of data. These are the two states. This is where the Himalayas are. Uh, you know, so this is Uttarakhand, and this is the coastal state. This is the sea, coastal state of Odisha. So then within each state, we're going to look at below and above cutoff villages, again, restricting village population to being within a close range of the cutoffs in the sample. So the red dots are above cutoff villages. The blue dots are below cutoff villages. So you see it's not like all the above cutoff villages are from one part and the below cutoff are from another. So they're very, very similar villages, very, very close to each other. But because of population differences, one of them gets a road, the other one doesn't. So you might wonder, this is India. You know, uh, I'm Indian, and I'm, I'm allowed to criticize what we have wrong in our country. So, and the criticism is you know, maybe there was a lot of corruption. Maybe the government said this is what's going to happen, but it won't. So let's see if population cutoffs really predict road construction. And here's a chart. This is sort of the population below the cutoff, and this is populations above the cutoff. So these guys are supposed to get more roads, and you do indeed see that these guys were much more likely to get roads in the data. On the other hand, you could worry that this change in the propensity to get a road Maybe because the above cutoff villages are indeed somehow different in a way that you and I can't think about on our feet right at this moment. And so here's some other data on other metrics for these same villages plotted across the same population cutoffs that should assure you that that wasn't quite the case. So there was no, so you see that smaller villages, for example, had less primary school than larger villages. But the key thing here is that there is no jump in the number of primary schools right around the cutoff, as there is with road construction. And this is what we are going to use to identify the effect of roads on lending. 
You might also worry that given this is India, is it true that the local politicians were manipulating the population numbers? So I have a village. My village has a population of 480. But I just happen to tell the government that you know my population is a 501. Why? Because then I'm going to get a road. One good thing that happened with this policy was when the, po when the policy was launched, it was going to be based on population figures from the 2001 population census in India. And the 2001 population census basically was done in the two years before 2000, 1999 and 2000. This was before the policy was decided. So if you wanted to manipulate the population, you had to have predicted that, the, that such a policy would come, which would have the cutoff exactly at 500 and not 600. 1,000 and not 900. And so it's still worth investigating. So this is a population. This is a distribution of villages by population. So you see smaller villages are more prevalent in the country than larger villages. What you see here is if there was manipulation, you would have expected this bar to be significantly high. Why? Because a bunch of villages from this side who would not get roads would manage to manipulate their way into the roads program by trying to claim that they were on that side. So here, what I'm showing you is that didn't seem to happen in the data, which should reassure you that the cutoff was indeed somewhat exogenous. So what's going to be the empirical methodology? It's going to be to compare financing in villages that were slightly below the cutoff with villages that were slightly above. So villages in above cutoff villages, the idea is should be very similar to those in below cutoff villages, except, except if you lived in an above cutoff village, then you are much more likely to have received a proper road during our sample period than if you, if you, were, you, know, if you were living in a below cutoff village. So that's it. That's what we do. And now let's talk about what do we find? Can we do well by doing good? So how do we do this? Well, we know there are some villages in which the bank lends. And so what we do is we find a bunch of other villages which are very, very similar to the villages in which the bank operates and assume that, well, the bank could have lent in these other villages as well. Let's see whether there's a correlation between whether a village is above a cutoff and what is the propensity of the bank having lent in that particular village? It turned out that the odds that an average villager who lived in an above cutoff village was about twice as likely to get a loan from our bank compared to one that lived in a below cutoff village. It also turned out that loans made to villagers in above cutoff villages, the amount of the loan, on average, was about 30 to 35% higher than those made in below cutoff villages. We then differentiated between what were they doing with that money? Were they using it, indeed, for productive purposes? Or was it all because you know I'm going to buy more clothes, or I'm going to buy a TV or a radio in these villages for my family? It turned out that you had to disclose to the bank what were your users for the money that you were taking from them. And the bank could potentially go and monitor you on what you said. It turned out that most of this difference in loans between above and below cutoff villages was coming from productive loans, loans for changing your crops, loans for micro enterprises or shops, rather than loans for consumption, marriages, or festival-related expenditures. But do private banks? in increasing their lendings to these villages with more opportunity, make intra-village inequality worse in the process. We've shown you financing does respond. But who does it benefit? Does it benefit the existing rich landlords in the village? Or does it benefit the true poor to take advantage of the roads that came to their village? It turns out that the results the increase in lending is actually stronger for poorer households, households who do not have significant cultivable land ownership. And land is the biggest asset in this context of rural India. And there's no difference based on age, gender, education. Notice that none of this lending was due to a government mandate. 
The government did not ask our bank to go to the rural area and lend. This was a private bank. This is a bank that's traded in the Indian stock exchanges that's purely trying to do this to explore the opportunity of making money by going out of their comfort zone and getting into rural India. So hopefully I've convinced you that the private sector could be a reliable partner for a government in allowing people to see some benefits from the infrastructure that the governments might be funding. Now I need to convince you as business students that you can actually make money in the process of doing this. And that's not clear. You could say, you know, is this just ESG? Is it, you know, we all want to do ESG, but we know that this is not necessarily profitable. So we might be doing great, but we may not make any money. And what's the problem with that? Well, then we can't continue doing great. If you want me to spend my money on things that doesn't generate more money, I'll finish my pot sometime, and that'll be the end of it. And so these are the other two tables. So all you have to see in this table is there are no stars anywhere, which in our world means there is no difference. So there is no difference in above and below cutoff villages with and without low roads in terms of the maturity of the loan, the default rate measured through the overdue amounts, or the percentage uh, 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 overdue. And the OD amount is time overdue, and percentage overdue is the amount that's overdue. And there was no difference in interest rates. On a baseline interest rate of 15% for rural lending, which is kind of high, but it's substantially lower than the competition, which is your rural money lender. So your interest rates in these villages, so this bank is around 15%. The interest rate in a village with a road was about 14.8%. So there's practically no difference. You're not giving cheap loans, and these loans are not defaulting more. Why not? You might be surprised by this. So we talked to the bank, and they said that this is because many of these people actually wanted the loan to do something productive, and they were eventually successful in changing their crop patterns, and therefore they were eventually successful in paying back the loans. So let me conclude. We find that private financing does indeed respond to changes in productive opportunities resulting from road connectivity. So private lenders do seem to recognize that there are opportunities of to step in where the state has created infrastructure and allow the people affected by this new development in infrastructure to take advantage of it and make their lives a bit better. Lending related to connectivity did not seem to worsen intra-village inequality in our sample. Finally, profits still seem to be possible in a world where you focus on doing well. Thank you very much. Very inspiring, very interesting talk. I think uh, after listening to your talk, one thing that I find really positive is that uh, the world is full of hope, <laughs> I think. Um, do we have any question from the audience here? Or those on Zoom? For our B-Rube's work, so I, I, I let me let me ask you a very quick question, our B-Rube. I, I think what you did is essentially what we call a regression discontinuity design here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you you did show a lot of different uh, statistics where you uh, demonstrate that the, um, the 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 places, the regions that you study were essentially identical. Um, how about in terms of the um, productivity of, of those regions. Did you actually have a measure about after the roads were constructed in terms of the overall productivity? I, I think you, you did not really show that just now, but I, I'm wondering. That's correct. So we did not show this in our paper, but there are other papers in agricultural economics, for example, that have showed that places with roads tend to have better agricultural productivity than places without. So you kind of rely on that literature for the direct productivity effects. So the focus is about agriculture, essentially, because these are rural yes, areas in exactly, India. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thank you.